Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, everybody from Hungary. Hi there. Lovely hey. to see you. Lovely to see you. Agnes, lovely to see you too. Lovely to see you too, all of you. I haven't seen Hi, you in a while. Agnes. Hi, Kat. Good to see you. At the moment, you're on mute, but I'm sure you won't be in a minute. I love you. Good morning. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. He didn't mean we can't mute you, Kat. Kat. <laughs> That's not what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really lovely to see everybody. Uh, Ada, are we complete now? That's great. Yes. Okay. I will continue meeting people if they join. In That'd the next be lovely. Minutes. Well, um, Andrew, you happy to crack on? Yes, I, yes, I am absolutely. Um, good afternoon to everyone. Well, wherever you are, hello, and delighted to see you all here. Um, as you know, we uh, we started the Elders Council. In fact, two years ago, this very day in this very uh, day, this very day in Aix in Provence, um, as a as, as a result of an uh, an event that um, Ashoka so kindly put on to because they believe that elders are very seniors and elders are so valuable in the community so um we're we're wishing ourselves a happy birthday um but we we really feel that um we've done some good groundwork over the last uh, 18 months and we've put on several webinars and we're beginning to gather some real wisdom and knowledge but we have so much to to learn and so much to hand on to to youngers so supporting uh, elders and helping and supporting youngers we're very lucky today to have shona mcdonald here from shona quip she's going to show some slides to um, a, a small presentation to show her, to, about her work but shona as so many of us is at a point where handing on the organization that she founded is part of her daily challenge so that's we're very happy to have you here Shona and then once Shona has done her presentation and explained a, a little about Shona Quip and her challenge at the moment we'll be able to talk to Arlette and Marisol from Bookbridge who have just uh, taken over from the founder of, of, of Bookbridge so that's a wonderful thing to hear the two sides and then we'll hear from Julia who's going to give us her views on how that might uh, just her reflections on what she's heard so over to you Shona thanks very much I'm just gonna share my screen and hi to everybody hi there um, hello there you go oops can you see my screen yet yeah perfect Okay. So just to give you a little context or background, um, I started Shona Quip over 30 years ago now, following the establishment of a number of nonprofit organizations. And from that work with the nonprofits I started, I realized the huge risk we all stood in terms of our, our systems change work and, and um, collaboration in that everything was so dependent on funders. So when I started Shonequip, I decided to take a leap of faith and launched it as a business, um, but committed to never um, drawing profit myself, rather investing that profit into the work that we wanted to do in an attempt to make it more sustainable. And um, that was sort of the birth of one of the first social enterprises in South Africa, and unknown to me, I didn't even know what it was. But our focus was very much and still is on our belief that an appropriate assistive device, could be a wheelchair or any other piece of equipment for a child, 
together with the knowledge to make informed choices and the agency to action this, um, results in a family of a child with a disability never needing to experience their child as less valued. And, and that is what we have pursued for the last 30 years. Um, on, I think if I look back at the things that really have inspired me, it's been the change we've, able, we've been able to make in terms of um, influencing the child's life with the device, but then also, and here you can see a, a before and after picture, a low cost uh, charitable donation chair, which really is only a convenience for the charity that donated it or for somebody who needs to push the child from A to B. But ultimately the, the impact we're trying to make is to change the child's life intrinsically and empower them to be independent, which you see in the second picture. So to do this, we've established a, a really an ecosystem of support around the child and their family. And that ecosystem includes, and it's, it's a coincidence that it, we use the same graphics as Catalyst, um, but it was just the way we started. And I think this, this concept of ecosystems has really evolved over years. We focus on advocacy and lobbying. We look obviously at our wheelchair production, design and seating services. And then we launch a, a, a huge drive into the education system, looking at inclusive schools and supporting that. And then together with economic participation and teaching and sharing and collaborating and capacity building of people with disabilities and their families themselves in terms of income generation and agency. Um, and to do this rather complex ecosystem approach, we've had to establish three different entities. So we have a business, which is shown equipped. We then added a humbo, which was the non-for-profit and recently we launched also um, a, a DPO, a Disabled People's Organization and a Membership Trust. And now we're sitting with, or I'm sitting with the challenge of how do we take this collective offering that we have, which, which touches on education, health, social development, and um, the economics and um, start putting in place a management structure that doesn't only focus on business, that doesn't only focus on nonprofit, but also doesn't think in a, a hierarchical way because ultimately our work is about empowering and building inclusive and um, what would you call them, uh, really diverse communities. And for, for us to be truly collaborative on the outside, I really believe we need to be collaborative on the inside as well, to experience and live what we need to practice. So I've really <laughs> struggled with pushback from every consultant and every advisor that I've come across and all the investors, they want to know that there's a CEO that they can rely on. And when I explain to them that we have three legal entities, we've got three boards, but all my boards sit at one board meeting. All my boards believe in our common purpose. I only have one team of staff. Yes, I might pay them from the money raised in the, in the nonprofit, or I might pay one of them from the business earned income, but ultimately we're only one team that delivers on one purpose with one collective board, even though the financials are all separated. And so this pushback to have one leader that actually almost personifies all three types of thinking has really become a challenge for me because I never realized that the way I thought was so different until I started trying to engage somebody to, to work with me to 
to take this forward. And so what we decided to do three years, four years ago now, we restructured the organization. We established, um, instead of having the three groups of, of staff working with three groups of people, we brought them all together we created what we call the compass operations, which is the operations team from each of the three entities. And then we established what is called the compass, which keeps us truly aligned with our purpose. And that compass is representative of the, the elements in the organization that I believe need to lead the organization's thinking. So that is the head of finance because that's the one area that investors and funders desperately need to believe in. The other one is the impact, the head of impact and learning, because ultimately as an organization to be fresh and reactive and responsive to the needs that we're trying to address, we really need to understand what difference we're making and be able to change that immediately. And then the third person on that compass team is myself that brings sort of the at the moment, the, the business um, thinking and the design thinking to the organization. Ultimately, we need to make sure that the leadership team has autonomy, accountability, and capacity building, but not in a centralized leadership role. And I didn't even want a decentralized role because we had already tried that in our three entities, having a head of the nonprofit, a head of the business, it didn't work. I think there's always that tension between people to want to push what they're in charge of harder than the other person. So there was a competitive edge in running them separately. So now what we've done, we've gone for a really distributed leadership model. Compass is basically the CEO. So those three people that lead the compass team for me represent the CEO, if you want to call it a, a corporate name, and they report directly to the board under their different headings. And the board acknowledges them as representing the organization as a whole. Um, I think as, as we grow into this, sort of strengthen this model, the importance of the teamwork and the collective thinking becomes more and more important because now not one person is leading, not one person is responsible. Um, it's a shared leadership. Um, and this distributed approach really, um, it needs to give autonomy and key decision-making and key to key areas of responsibility. So really understanding our own areas of responsibility really becomes exceptionally important. Um, and for that to happen, we, we are learning to have extremely frank conversations. And I so think that is key to this success. Um, Shona, can we, can we just um, uh, end your uh, part on, on the shared leadership and that uh, agency and ownership issue because I think that that's something that really will um, resonate with with people so that would be yes. it would be a wonderful thing to be able to take that part and 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 move it on to Arlette and Marisol can you forgive me for moving you along no no, no I've finished that was the end <laughs> That, it, but but really your explanation of, of that and and one of the the only question I would love to ask you when, when we have time is about the sustainability of Shona as well as the sustainability and and shared leadership but I won't go into that now but I I, I loved your explanation thank you so much and what amazing work Pleasure. over 30 years and what a challenge you have ahead um uh, Marisol Arlette, um, we'd love to we'd love to hear from you. You have a different perspective altogether because you've taken over from a founder. So we know that uh, that also has immense challenges. So we'd love to hear from you both. 
Thank you, Andrea. So I will start. And yeah, together with Arlette, we are here today to share how has been for us the experience to take the leadership from the founder of Bookbridge. So we were appointed co-CEOs, right, because we do this role together in November last year, when the former CEO and founder of Bookbridge decided to take two years sabbatical with his family. But to understand how this experience has been for us and, and what we have learned so far, I want to first explain a bit of what we do and how we do it. So Bookbridge is a social enterprise in which we develop leaders while creating social impact. So we offer an action learning program where we bring together different stakeholders who collaborate in developing a business plan for a social enterprise in deprived communities. So Arlette and I are co-CEOs of this social enterprise, which belongs to the Bookbridge Foundation. And our foundation has a board, and this board oversees the operations of our social enterprise and also the support that we give to social entrepreneurs in our network. Then to make our programs possible or to make them happen, we collaborate closely with three local teams in Cambodia, Mongolia, and Sri Lanka, who we call country partners. And they support us locally in these three uh, different countries to recruit social entrepreneurs <clears throat> and also to keep all the, the people in our network together and keep all the members close to each other. Then also part of the programs, we work with external partners such as coaches who facilitate the sessions in our programs, impact investors who become part of our projects and engage not only with their money, but also with their time and their, their expertise, professionals who participate in our program to experience entrepreneurship and to become purpose-driven leaders, and also with organizations who send their talents to our program and want to collaborate with us and develop their own programs. So as you see, it's a, a, a big network that we work with. And considering the complexity of our working setup, the transition from one founder slash CEO to two co-CEOs, of course, felt a bit overwhelming, right? So it was the two of us thinking, how are we gonna manage all these stakeholders? How are we gonna split work? How are we gonna do it together? And keep both of us aware of everything that is happening and how do we handle our communication and everything internally, right? And well, changes are not easy, right? And, and almost everyone uh, feel when there's a change. And for the Book Bridge Network, we know this was definitely a big change. The, um, the founder of Bookbridge is a very charismatic man, and this successful social enterprise was his passion and his dream, right? So everything, as you can imagine, was built around him, around his network, his friends, his personality, and his vision. So several times, we have, we've heard people saying, Bookbridge is Karsten, and Karsten is Bookbridge, right? So they immediately put the, those two things together. So you can imagine how tough it was for us, right? We couldn't avoid asking or questioning ourselves, right? Are we here to fill in these big shoes or are we here to create our own impact and our own legacy, right? So this was a, a big thing at the beginning, right? How, how do we uh, tackle the challenge or how do we come to the organization? Um, of course, when the opportunity came up, Arlette and I, as I think social entrepreneurs by heart, we felt really excited about it. We had the chance to take over a running and very successful social enterprise and become leaders ourselves, right? Internally in our organization, we try to, to, to give everyone the freedom to act as leaders, right? But of course, this figure of the CEO and founder was very, very strong. And then he was taking the sabbatical and Arlette and I were taking the leadership role. So it was a big uh, yeah, excitement of what we could do together. Um, we can say that we both um, truly believe in, in Bookbridge's vision, right? And, and our motto of doing what we really are or doing what you really are. So we definitely feel engaged with the Bookbridge purpose. And I think this is part of the success or, or what keeps us here and what keeps us motivated. And actually before joining or taking this position, we both were part of the, of the program as let's say clients. And then we continue to be engaged with Bookbridge until we both started working with the organization. So this shows that we have always believed in what Bookbridge does and, and really feel passion for it. So I think this is a bit of, of the secret <laughs> inside. Um, 
Yeah, but when we, of course, took the challenge, there was a lot of anxiety, a lot of questions, right? And, and it, one thing is being part of the organization and taking one role, but another thing is leading it and, and being the one taking the decisions. And then, of course, doing it between two people. This is, is different, right, than just being you and making all decisions. But yeah, I mean, here we are, we still have the passion about social entrepreneurship, about making an impact and about growing as leaders ourselves. So I will now hand over to Arlette and she will share with you a bit of the challenges that we've faced and the lessons that we have learned. So over to you, Arlette. Thank you, Marisol. So um, yes, as Marisol mentioned, I would like to share with you some of the challenges we are, we're facing actually. And uh, first of all, um, the setup we have with, with the foundation in the role as advisory board um, has um, at times limited or clashes sometimes with our day-to-day -day operations. And of course, we're trying to, to find a way to, to work together, right? So we are a foundation, but also we have a commercial part. Um, secondly, we are facing two different levels of transition. So it's not only that um, the former CEO and co-founder of Bookbridge uh, left on sabbatical. Uh, before he left, we started with a transition to empower our um, core team, our country teams, and we wanted that they um, are independent from Bookbridge. Um, we started with this some time ago, and I think uh, we underestimated this. Um, so one of the biggest challenges we're facing is that our country partners now are not ready to be independent. And, and this also uh, affected, affects the culture, right? Because we transitioned from a group of team, a group of persons working in a team to collaborative partners. And um, last but not least, we transitioned from a startup that was set up in 2009 to now growing into a small enterprise that uh, needs to set processes and ensure quality to meet the needs of, of our clients. Because in the end, the, the motor, let's say, uh, of um, Bookbridge is also the commercial part. Otherwise, the other part wouldn't be um, existing. And of course, the impact is our right to exist. Um, so somehow, we still need to meet the standards of, of our clients. What we learned is that, um, well, co-CEO, CEO is just a title, and we have to earn this title. We have to, to build credibility, network, and this takes time. Um, also, we learned that uh, we can, Marisol and myself, we have this role divided, but we cannot be in all the meetings and with all the stakeholders. So what we do is we divide the, the decision making process, but we meet every week um, to align and to once we have to make a decision to act as one voice. So we have uh, one meeting um, focused on strategic topics and one meeting meeting focused on um, operational topics. And also we learned that we need to make the, the, the vision, the vision that also the co-founder left, our own vision. Otherwise it doesn't feel authentic and it feels more like we are reading from a website. So we took the time together with our country partners to, to define values for our collaborating team and to, to really make this vision our own. This, this meant also that some of the KPIs linked to that vision need to be revised. And we made that step because we needed to, to feel that the vision was our own. Um, and last but not least, we started to also formalize guidelines that before um, the co-founder had uh, certain uh, guidelines in his head, but we needed to make them 
formal so that also that gives more clarity to all our stakeholders and uh, especially in terms of impact uh, investment. So yeah, these are the main challenges and lessons learned. And we hope this also helps you uh, to transition into, into more uh, leadership roles and uh, to empower you also, because I think it's important to enable the team uh, as soon as possible to, to also, um, yeah, to, to pass the torch of, of the leadership. So with this, I would like to hand over to, to Julia. Thank you, Arlette. Thank you, Marisol. What, what courage you have. Uh, very, very thrilled to hear from you both. And, um, you know, I really, I really admire what, you're, what you've taken on and how you're shouldering this, this, uh, this work. So congratulations. Um, I'd love to hear from Julia now. I, I'll, I think it's best if I let Julia describe her own uh, journey now. And um, I'd like her to just review what she's heard from Shona, Marisol and Arlette from their different perspectives on leading social enterprises. So over to you, Julia. Thanks so much. And what a privilege and pleasure to be here and to listen and take in this depth of wisdom. And I was frantically scribbling notes and I was thinking, am I actually listening properly? So um, forgive me for kind of note taking instead of being in that really active listening space. Uh, it's a challenge I think I've made a note of for myself. And as um, Andrea mentioned, so I um, am founder of Orchid Project, which uh, I set up in 2011 to work for a world free from female genital cutting, and then made the very difficult choice to step away as CEO um, two years ago now. And um, I'm on this journey, as so many of us are, about transition, um, how long it takes, how we also deal, I think, with not only the organizational and the structural, but as this group knows so well, the emotional and the psychological and the personal. So one um, reflection, I think, I, I, I wrote down some kind of headings of what I heard in a way. One was ownership and vision and I felt that was very linked to the leadership point. So I'll hope to just explore those two a little bit more. The other was obviously um, both organizations dealing with huge structural issues. So thank you so much for sharing your challenges as well and Shona outlining the complexity of what uh, you're dealing with but also from the Bookbridge perspective, some of those challenges around uh, your partners and, and what organizationally that is meaning for you. I felt there was a, a whole bit around purpose that in a way spoke so strongly, um, you didn't need to speak to this bit because all of you, your passion was so obvious and key and important but I thought Marisol brought that out um, quite strongly in her reflections about uh, as a passionate person who believed in this vision, being able to step forward in a very authentic way. And of course we talked as well, uh, or rather you talked about outside inside. I thought that was worth reflecting on a little bit. So I'm just gonna, dive in a tiny bit on some of those and then kind of end with um, just a couple of reflections from me from my personal journey, but also so delighted to look forward to the questions because I know this is where the richness really, really comes in. Um, to take the leadership point first, I, I thought um, actually the innovation Shona that, that you're showing in terms of both talking very clearly about distributed leadership and what that means to you. Um, you yourself as a charismatic founder, um, you yourself, I'm sure, as a charismatic leader. Um, 
being bold and, and daring to say, I've had so many people advise me that this is the right way, but I know my organization. And I think that that is innovative. You, you standing with what you know, what you've seen, how you've journeyed this path. Um, and also that wisdom of saying, this is how I believe it, it should be um, structured in order to take that forward. And why shouldn't we have both distributed leadership, collective leadership, and in this time where we really are rewriting the rule book, pushing back and saying, we believe so strongly in the inside reflecting the outside that we've gone for this model of three people because we know our business really well. I guess the interesting challenge you must be facing is that bit we all get as founders of, well, we know our business when we're in it and things move on. And I guess the others from Bookbridge also grappled with this when they had to reset the vision and really say to themselves, okay, in terms of ownership, in order to show others that we are at the helm, uh, this is how we uh, need to do this, of, of looking at that. I'd love to just test that theory, but um, I, felt, I felt actually almost a bit of tension personally there because I think I folded under some of that external scrutiny of um, we need one CEO. Uh, I, I realized that I'm, I've been wedded to that model of what leaders look like. So thank you for helping me explore that. And I, I'm really interested in where, where that conversation takes you and how others come alongside. I'm sure, um, I don't know if anyone's read Matthew Barzan and his book about, um, typically I've forgotten what it's called. If anyone can remember, throw it in the chat, but his whole book about redistribution of power and, and how he is um, US ambassador to the UK works. And I think that outside insight is really important in terms of the, our self-awareness and what we know about our systems. And I think the other point I wanted to bring in was about this constellation, this ecosystem. And Shona, you, you showed it so beautifully in that diagram, but we all know um, that different parts of our constellation act very, very differently to leadership. So our donors want one thing, our partners want another, but what about those we're working with? What about those uh, who, who, are, who are not as seen, not as visible within those power structures and how we talk to them and how we truly represent them? So again, kudos to both organizations and all three of you for doing that. I think um, the organizational was just fascinating. And, and I wonder again about um, this tension of what we feel, what we know, what we intuit, how um, we move that from our operation into mechanisms and into vehicles. So we're back to the structural here as well. That sense of um, knowing the blurred lines that uh, there are, knowing that you know, one conversation in the corridor can lead to funding, whereas the three-year strategy might not. Um, and how in that translation from the spirit, the energy, the passion, the charisma, to the vehicle and to the mechanism. There's so much between those two. And I think that communication part is absolutely vital. I think I'm about to run out of time. So um, I will just leave you with that thought that as ever in my life, when I've been in something and in the weeds, in the foothills, I kind of don't know what the landscape looks like from the horizon. And uh, this is the same more than ever now. So, um, but my reflections are meant to offer um, absolute, um, I've forgotten the word, support. <laughs> support. <laughs> for you and your visions and thank you for you sharing.
Julia, thank you so much for, for, for that and, and to bring your own um, experience so, so powerfully into that. And uh, I'd just like to pick up on one word that you said about folding up. I also, as I handed over my own organization, I, I, I use that word often about folding in terms of, in the face of people wanting one, one CEO. And, and I think that the way that um, Shona is, is doing that is really brave. And I think the way that uh, Marisol and Ale let have, have taken it on is incredibly brave and, and, and both breaking new ground. So thank you so much for, for your reflection, Julia. Um, I'd love to um, um, just very briefly um, hand over to anybody who'd like to ask a question. I know that um, people will have found this very, very uh, close to their close to their hearts that, uh, at, uh, in this group. So please just um, come forward and ask a question. Andrea, there's a question in the uh, chat there from Caitlin. Oh, sorry. Right. Caitlin, put your question, please. Live in person. Hello. Um, this question was uh, really for Shona. Um, so Julia mentioned that you, you represent the people you are working with um, through the three boards. But I was just wondering how you kind of gather that information of what their views are so that you can make sure that the boards are representing them. I'm not quite sure I, I understand the question clearly, but um, are you talking about the, the team or the, or the externals? J just tell me again. I suppose I'm talking about the externals. Are, are, are the people we work with outside yeah. the organization, yeah. how, we, how we represent them. Okay, we have an extensive, I, I would say that when you look at most organizations, their financial reporting is exceptional because they know they have to report to funders. They're held accountable through their financials. We have made a just really, really, really strong effort to have our impact reporting as strong as our financials. So all the data we collect, and we you can at any time of any day, you can watch the data coming in. So it's live reported data, and you can uh, examine that at any time um, and use that to write dedicated or pull dedicated data and reporting. So we, we can show the board at any time exactly what people out there on the ground with our teams are doing or what they are thinking, what they're wanting, what's working, what's not working, the same way you would pull management accounts and, and explore those. The challenge in, in building an organization that has a manufacturing plant with, with unions and bargaining councils, social services, educational services and health services to bring that all together into um, a way of managing and a way of reporting has been the biggest challenge. But the actual reporting of our data and what the impact we make, that's been the joy. That's far more fun than any financial reporting because we can, we can shift our direction immediately when we see that there's a need somewhere that we're not addressing or something new has come up. Um, I'd, I'd like to put a question to all three of you, if I may, and, and, and obviously time is short and I know other people will have questions, but I'd just love to know very quickly how each of you takes care of yourself, never mind your organisation or your board or anything else, how do you look after yourself? Shona, how do you look after yourself? <laughs> um, my best time of being able to think clearly and ground myself is when I'm outdoors with my animals. So if you find me in the chicken run or walking the dogs, then you know that I'm very cool, doing well. You're feeling good. Um, okay. And I'm getting information. I'm getting my brain to spark in the way I need it to. 
That's great. We, we hope to find you in the chicken run. Hi, Marisol. <laughs> well, from my side, I think I have learned how to to say no to things, right? I have a, a small daughter and I can only work during the morning because then I am with my daughter. So at 1 p.m. I close my computer and that's it. And I think sometimes I feel stressed because there's a lot to do that I'm not doing, but that's a way where I take time for myself and my family and keep a balance between work and, and my role as a mother. <laughs> Great. Paulette? So in my case, I think um, I'm in a work in progress. <laughs> so uh, I made myself the promise not to work over the weekend, which is the time when uh, I could have a more a clear head instead of, you know, the day-to-day the -day business. Um, so some last weekend I broke that promise. <laughs> but that's why I'm saying I'm a work in progress. But uh, setting boundaries, that's important, I think. It, it's tough and and we all know we all know how you feel we th I think we've all been there so thank you for that um I'll let uh, Marisol we have a, a question here um it, it, this may be a tough one for you but but um uh, uh, has has the founder actually gone or does he um sometimes is he sometimes in touch with you to help and guide you or are, are they is he just um has confidence that you are going to find your own way and your own leadership and, and one more question do we do we know or do you not know whether whether the uh, founder intends to come back if you find any of those questions too difficult you know just um just do what you can so uh, Marisol, it's okay if I start and then you compliment. So with regards to um, ever, yeah. So he stepped down from the commercial registry um, last year, right, uh, Marisol? Yeah, October. October, October. And then he left uh, on a cycling tour, I think the second half of this year. And he hasn't contact actively contacted us for you know for operations or for anything related to to book bridge um and he plans to come back so that was the idea um but we haven't really spoken about this marisol yeah no exactly what arlette said so yeah uh, he uh, um, removed himself from the commercial registry, but he was there for six months, kind of supporting us and also finishing some projects that he had. And once he left on the on his cycling tour, he's completely gone. So we don't know anything about him or, or he's not um, saying anything about Bookridge or how we should do things. And yeah, he, he said he will come back. He's open to come back with new projects, new ideas. And he always said it's up to us to decide whether he comes on what position. So let's see when he comes back, how this <laughs> turns. Well, that's immense. It's a, an immense tribute to both of you, but I, I think we all really share the view that you're taking, you know, hearts like lions, taking this on in, a, in an amazing way. So congratulations to you both for that. Absolutely. Uh, Andrea, there was just one, um, one small piece of the question missed out about how people look after themselves. Maybe Julia could have answered as well. Yes. Oh, yes. Sorry, Julia, please. How do you, how do you take care of yourself? Oh, thank you, Chris. Um, well, ultimately, I think I took care of myself by deciding to exit. There you are. Yeah, that's, and that's the tough, yeah. the tough choice that um, I think fundamentally faced me and and I did a lot of you know I joined a choir and I did all the things you're meant to do um but I think it was it was really that staring oneself in in the face and 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 grappling with you know I use the term but grappling with power you know when was I willing willing to to demit to self-diminish in with my organization in order to 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 move away so there was a huge battle with ego and all sorts of things that i went through um but two years out um and happy anniversary to 
this group as well, um, I'm in such a great space. I would never have imagined where I would be today looking at it from two years ago. So that's me. So th there's a real lesson to be learned there, Julia, that, that um, and, I, and I have to say with my own organization, I went through the same um, sort of terrible pain, but then, you know, working through that, who are you if you're not your organization and all those um, issues, we've held a webinar on that particular thing about who are you if you're not your organization um but i think that that something we can all learn is that it it you have to work at it but it also may take two years and then all of a sudden you know you're reborn <laughs> I, I would love to add something here um, Please, Jonah. i stepped back from my organization 10 years ago when the board asked me to step back um, during a really tough financial crisis that we experienced based on the World Cup soccer and government orders um, disappearing. And um, it didn't work. And I had to, the person they put in charge, I didn't choose, the person they put in charge, um, it just, it, it wasn't working. I had to step in and fire him as, as the founder and owner. And, and start from scratch again, building up the, the culture of the organization, which had really been stripped and damaged. And it's taken us, it took about eight years to get that culture back and to hit us back on the uh, sort of really aligned with our values. And um, that was why I think I've been so strong in and determined to do it my way. And when you talk, Julia, about, of, of the power to, to get out. For me, it's more about the safety to the organization. It's not about what's right for me right now. It's about what's, how can I make sure that what I leave behind will continue to serve the hundreds of thousands of people that we work with. And um, so there has been a, a time when I really felt like going to crawl and hide under my bed and never see the world again. But then on the other hand, I feel that the way I'm, I'm handling this is I can incrementally step out and I can incrementally step out in a way that I know things are safe and I can move to doing things I just want to do or I can move out completely. And, and that's been the design decision that I took versus um, what was right for me because that, that hasn't worked, but I, I think there's an element, it can work either way, depending on what the circumstances are, obviously. So I, I have a question then to, to Julia, because that's really, really fascinating, Shona. I mean, Julia, uh, listen to Shona, imagine a situation where your organization you suddenly found was in financial trouble for whatever reason in the same way that Shona's was. Would you ever think about going back into the organization to, to rescue it if that scenario emerged? So it was really clear to me that in stepping out, I, I had to allow my board to undertake what they needed to in terms of governance. And so I now, I now serve in whatever capacity I can as, as the board um, direct me to you know, within a wider framework, but um, so I think if they came to me and said, Julia, will you, I, I might consider that. Um, but I think that I, I feel I'm in a, in a different position from Shona, where she said as founder owner, she had to step in. Um, unless I give that governance role to the board, um, I think that then just allows me to keep potentially going back in and undermining not only their power, but the power of the new CEO. That, that all sounds very rational and very clear. Um, none of this is the emotional reality. <laughs> Never is. I feel with just 10 minutes to go, and I know that Mel is going to do a very neat 
wrap up for us at the end, but I, I just feel that some of you have got burning questions you, you want to ask, and I just want to encourage you to do that. However, you know, however you feel about asking a question, this just seems to be such a, an important um, topic with such important speakers that it would be really good to hear some more questions. Chris, were you, are you, are you wishing to speak? Thank you. Yeah, I, well, I, first of all, I would agree with you that this is a very important topic and we've had some great speakers today. Um, we've also got some uh, new friends with us today, which is good and uh, be happy to welcome them as well. Uh, perhaps we could ask uh, either Marty or Krista to come on board and just um, say a couple of words. Well, sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Krista. Um, I'm from the United States. I'm phoning in from California. And um, I'm a founder. I started a social justice organization that works with kids in the juvenile justice and criminal justice system um, in the Bay Area of California. And after serving as founder for over 20 years and CEO, I stepped down as CEO um, and a successor um, who had worked with me for six years took over. And so I'm a year plus um, from my transition and I'm actually working with another a fellow who is an Echoing Green and Draper Richards Kaplan fellow. And we are trying to pull together and do some research and talk to founders and talk to folks who have succeeded founders because we both found at least in the US that there was such little research and toolkits available for us. And we were making it up as we went along. And we also found that founders were just so generous with their time and their advice that we feel that there's this collective wisdom we wanna capture um, and try to make more available, um, easily available for other founders as they're going through this. So I saw this um, notice and I'm so excited to be with you all. We're, we're working on trying to develop a framework and toolkits and best practices. So I'll be reaching out. Um, to folks on this call, but if it's anything that you are are interested in or would be willing um, to participate or talk with us, we would just so love to connect with you all. Um, so I'll put my my information in the chat and I will follow up with Chris and Andrea and, and get all connected, but super grateful for this space and um, just so grateful for the wisdom and the humility and the love and the support that's all over the world right now. It's just, it's really inspiring. So thank you for allowing me to be here. And it's nice to virtually meet you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Krista. Really wonderful to hear from you and what and hear what you're doing. Um, Kat, I know you'd like to say something. Uh, yes, good morning. I don't have a question or an answer, but I'd like to quickly share an insight that I had about that transitioning from the founder role. Um, I saw a movie this week, Marshall, and it was about Thurgood Marshall before he became Supreme Court uh, Justice. And the last scene of the movie, he actually was doing it. He met a family where he was going to help them work on a case. And he was staying with the family. And it was that the way that it happened just reminded me of the way my organization worked in the beginning and the role that I played in the organization of being the founder and being the mother of a movement that is now 30 years later. And although I struggle very hard to keep up with the technology and keep up with the new words and keep up with the whatever, the place where I actually belonged was in that very beginning when it was starting and people were meeting in their homes and spending the night with each other and really working together in that way. That is who I am and that's where I'm comfortable. And seeing that just reassured me of where I stand in the development of this whole movement globally. And I just had that peace and that sense of, I don't have to do those things. I can be exactly where I am and be me. And being grandmother is better than being mother. If I had known how wonderful my grandchildren were gonna be, as someone said, I would have skipped the parenting part and gone straight to the grandchildren. And so that one scene just 
put me, this gave me the perspective I needed to be at peace with where I am in all of these puzzles that make up the big picture. That's great. Andrea, you're on mute at the moment. Yeah. Marty, I, I, I see you're one of our new newcomers here. I wonder if you have any, before we hand over to Mel for a wrap up, if you had a, a minute or two, you wanted to make yeah. any comments about what you've heard? Andrea, thank you so much. And I'm so happy to, to be with you. My English is not the best, uh, but- Sounds <laughs> great to me. Thank you, thank you. I am from Hungary and uh, oh. uh, are you are you here? Yes, we are here. Yeah, you did you okay you because did freeze there, but yeah, but okay. keep on going. Okay, because I have some problems with the internet connection, and I'm so so glad and happy to be with you because uh uh, I am one of the founders of, uh, of the Bloom program, and uh, we founded it 17 years ago. And uh, basically, we. <laughs> created um, a very kids and the teachers and their parents. And what is happening this year is that uh, we almost or I can say that we finished. Um, uh, Marty, a big part um, of the work. We have the handbook. We have the methodology. Uh, well, yeah. C can you hear me? Yeah. You you actually keep on freezing, and I I feel bad now because uh, I've invited you to speak, and now <laughs> you keep freezing. I just wonder okay. if um, if we could if you could join us on our next session. We could keep in touch with you uh, so that we can continue the conversation. But for Mel to do his wrap up. Please forgive me for that, Marty. No, thank you so much. And I will be happy to join you next uh, time. Thank you so Wonderful. much for the invitation. Thank you so much. Mel, wrap up for us. Uh, okay, th th thank you very much, Andrea. Well, it, it, it falls on me the past two or three meetings to, to wrap up, which um, those of you who joined uh, those meetings will know, I always say this is extremely difficult to do. Uh, because um, there's always such rich content and, 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 and so much uh, in it. And in this particular occasion, Julie is really helped by her insights as a, a, a responder. But really, <clears throat> I think what we heard from Shona, first of all, was, was her journey about her organisation and then the challenges as she's come back into it, but with some really um, uh, fantastic uh, innovation in terms of leadership going forward which she's uh, been determined to push through, as Julia said, and that is um, inspiring. And then, of course, we heard from uh, um, Arlette and Marisol about taking over when a founder leaves. And once again, uh, you know, they've had to reassess uh, vision, where the staff are, where the, where the organization is going to. Um, and uh, I, I think this is very, very valuable uh, uh, insights that they're giving. So from a different, different perspective altogether, and then <laughs> Mel, you've got to mute it. <laughs> Was I muted that whole time? No, not the whole time, but to suddenly. <laughs> suddenly you got, were gone. Suddenly you were being very shy. This is a new experience for me um, uh, since I didn't touch the computer, but maybe somebody's trying to shut me up. I think um, <laughs> Ada was trying to shut you up. <laughs> At which part was I muted? <laughs> the part where you said what a beautiful looking guy you were. <laughs> oh, that part. That's why I was muted. <laughs> well, to continue, what I was kind of saying was, um, uh, collectively, what we had here is some great insights. Uh, first of all, from the, the founder side, two, two, two founders, and how they are developing their exit planning, um, and how that's gone and, you know, in a personal perspective, how challenging that could be, but at the same time wanting to preserve the organization because really it's what we're all in it for. It's about the, the social impact. It's about the outcomes and, and, you know, that drive. And then from Marisol and Arlette coming in 
as uh, uh, um, new, uh, replacing the founder, but having that same passion, that same drive, and then having to deal with the organization, establish themselves as leaders, get to know everybody, they're new, and particularly in their case, where the, where the founder was, you know, associated with, with, with the organization, like so many of us have experienced, like the founder's going, oh my God, how, how do you deal with all of that? So building up that trust and those connections and building partnerships and respect, et cetera, across the organization is a real challenge, but they, they, they're clearly doing it. It's really, really interesting. I'd love to talk to you again in 18 months where if, if the founder or when the founder reemerges and how that, that dynamic goes, because I think it's, a, it's, it's fascinating. I don't think there's so many examples of that. Um, and, and Julia's experience as well, really just in terms of uh, uh, her reflections, I think were, were really, really insightful for us all. We're all in this, in this place at the moment, really, I guess, about how we transition um, how we change, how we build our organizations at the same time as we move on. So some really, really fa fabulous insights in this session as ever. Um, and maybe I could just kind of finish um, by saying that uh, then, then Kat came up with this great, this great uh, insight herself. It's just feeling that she was part of, of something, part of the family, uh, part of the community, and that's where she felt most comfortable and um, I, I kind of personally kind of resonated with that. Kat said she was the grandmother and was easier than being a mother. I'm a grandfather, maybe it's even be easier than being a father. But, but, but it's a very interesting way of explaining how we all sit maybe actually, uh, is that that's, that's what, why we came, the, what motivated it into this wasn't necessarily about the structures of organizations, it's because we were passionate about what we wanted to do, what the outcomes that we wanted to have, the values we, 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 we shared with others the society we wanted to see, um, and that's where we're comfortable. So we're probably going to keep challenging uh, uh, the, the issues of structure and change and moving on and so on in, in future sessions. It's a really a live issue, and I, I think it's, it's great um, everybody is sharing their personal experiences with everybody because it's very, very valuable, I think, to all of us, certainly to me um, uh, from a personal level, but I'm sure for everybody, just, just sharing all that. So. Thank you very much to everybody, and um, uh, uh, we'll see you soon. So back to you, uh, um, uh, Andrea. Thank you so much, Mel. I know we're a little over time here, but I, I want to thank you all too uh, so much. And um, to remind you that we, our next webinar is on the 6th of December at uh, UK time, 4 p.m. So I hope you'll join us. Um, I, I, I really wish you all well and uh, i hope the session has been enjoyable and helpful to you all and it's wonderful to see you thank you chris thanks so much andrea that's lovely um beautiful session i can see everybody is very happy with it um and this is our birthday today is our birthday we are two years old today <laughs> and uh, quite a number of the people here including kat and agnes and of course yourself andrea and mel we were all at uh, in Aix-en-Provence, issuing our charter, our proclamation from Aix-en-Provence for the Elders' Council. So that was lovely that we could um, have a webinar actually on today. Yeah, it's been great. Many thanks indeed, Andrea, for the session. Thank you. And I'll let Marisol, don't forget to lean on us all a little as you move forward. Thank yeah. you, Andrea. Thank you, Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye. 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 bye.